Today's lesson is going to be about DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. So what is it about this molecule that makes it so special? Why is it the molecule that we think of when we hear about genetics and heredity? And what is it about this molecule that makes it so useful in forensic science that lets us identify people? So today, the learning targets that we want to be able to know and be able to do at the end of the lesson is to number one, explain what DNA is by name and biomolecule type. Number two, describe DNA's functions. Number three, explain what genes are. And then four, five, six, and seven are under the umbrella of describing DNA's structure. Number one, what's its monomer, the name of it, and what's in one of those monomers. Number five, the overall shape of the molecule. Six, what holds the molecule together. And seven, the law of complementary base pairing. So we will continue past this lecture learning about the things that we talked about just a minute ago, why it's so useful in forensic science. But first, we need to get through the basics. Let's first start talking about what your body is made of, and let's start looking at some of the major molecules of your body. So people and all of your cells are going to be made up of four classes of large biological molecules, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. These are the four major biomolecules. Now, within you are 100 trillion cells that make up your body, small organic molecules are joined together to form larger molecules. So we can build something bigger from things that are smaller. Now, when we use the term organic in science, what exactly are we talking about with the word organic? Well, in a, on a scientific basis, what we want to explain is that these molecules that are organic, they contain the element carbon. So these are carbon-containing molecules, carbon-containing substances. Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids all have a lot of carbon, and that's why they're organic. Now, a lot of the molecules in your body are considered macromolecules. They're large molecules composed of thousands of covalently connected atoms. So atoms that share electrons with each other can build some pretty big structures. Take a look at this one down here in the bottom right. That is a enormous structure, and that is the enzyme that we call trypsin. Now, trypsin is going to be used inside the body to perform a specific task. That's what enzymes do. But this one happens to be made of 223 amino acids. So this is going to qualify under the protein category because the simplest piece of a protein is an amino acid. And this happens to be 223 of them linked together. Inside your body, trypsin is a digestive enzyme that hydrolyzes or breaks down proteins. Let's do a little more with some basic idea and vocab about macromolecules, polymers, and monomers. So first, if we talk about polymers in science, we're talking about big long molecules that consist of very similar little building blocks. So these little tiny building blocks have a name and their name is monomer. And you can almost think of them as essentially pieces of a long train. So we have our engine, we have additional train cars that are connected behind that engine. And you start putting all these together and we go from individual monomers, when they link up, they become a po polymer. Same thing happens with little tiny biomolecules within the body from three out of the four classes of biomolecules. So we said earlier, we have carbohydrates, we have proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. And three out of the four of these do form these long chains called uh, polymers. And those are your carbohydrates, your proteins, and nucleic acids. That means lipids don't exactly do this. They actually do get bigger and they tend to ball up more than anything uh, versus form extremely long chains. So when you put a whole bunch of monomers together into a polymer, they then kind of rise up to the classification of being a macromolecule at that point. And the one we're going to spend the most time on today clearly is going to be DNA, and that is a form of a nucleic acid. So DNA is a nucleic acid polymer made of many, many monomers. So we've all heard about DNA, and we likely covered it in our first biology class, but what exactly does it do? Well, let's look at its official roles within living things. Number one is it stores genetic information through its rather simplistic structure of 
mostly A's, T's, C's, and G's and a couple of backbones. It stores all the genetic information about you. You can basically build another you if we could extract all of the DNA from inside the nucleus of just one of your hundred trillion cells and put it through a machine that could build it that know that could build it that knows the code of DNA. So essentially we could build a clone of you because all the DNA inside of your nucleus tells us everything we need to know about how you're built. Number two, DNA directs synthesis of RNA and through it controls protein synthesis. So without the protein workers and helpers inside your body, we don't exist to live. So we always have these little proteins in all the cells of our body doing particular tasks that help with the constancy and the daily routine of cells in something that's alive. Number three, DNA provides directions for its own replication. So in order for cells to divide, what needs to happen is that DNA has to be copied and it can provide directions for its own replication and it's 99.99999% accurate every time. So in your first biology experience, Perhaps you talked about chromosomes versus chromatin. So chromosomes are those X-like structures that you probably recall from when the cell was dividing. But most of the time, the DNA is not in those X-like structures. Instead, we call it chromatin. It's loosely unwound and it floats inside the nucleus of every cell. So right here, you don't see any X-like structures in these cells. You just see kind of purple blobs throughout. And that's what chromatin is. Now, sometimes that chromatin is wound up as the case here of heterochromatin, and sometimes it's unwound, it's kind of in that uh, more diffuse pink area, which means it's unwound and it's probably being copied for a number of purposes. Now, on a strand of DNA from one location to another, it can encode for a working protein or perhaps another task, and that's what we refer to as a gene. Now, all of your DNA is not full of genes from start to finish genes that code for something. At least we don't think so. We found recently that some of the segments that we're not so sure of actually perform some regulatory functions, like turning up the synthesis of a particular protein or turning it down in a number of other tasks. But genes, for the most part, are going to be the segments we talk about that code for something, usually protein-based, and it will be copied from the DNA to an RNA and then that RNA will go find a ribosome to essentially build a polypeptide or a protein from. So the genes are those segments of DNA. So if we're looking at an unwound portion of this chromosome here, we can see we have um, a gene from this end here to this end here. Notice we also have a couple other terms called exon and intron. So in our species, exons get expressed. So this portion from here to here would essentially be copied and threaded through a ribosome to build a protein. This intron in the middle, this gets cut out. So this will basically not be used within um, a ribosome to produce protein. This exon down here from this portion here to this portion here is also one of those segments that will be expressed as a protein. Collectively, the whole set of exon, intron, and exon in this example would be our gene. So you can't have function without having structure. In fact, a common theme in biology is that structure fits function. So that's where we're headed next. We're gonna talk about the structure of DNA. Nucleic acids are polymers called polynucleotides. Now, poly means many, and nucleotides are the official unit of what we're talking about. If you look over here to the right, you can see what a nucleotide is. It's composed of three things, a phosphate group, a pentose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. This three-part molecule right here is gonna be found as a monomer in this chain. You can see one here, so this would be nucleotide number one, two, three, and four. That makes a polynucleotide when they bond together. So then again, each nucleotide consists of a nitrogen-containing base, a pentose sugar, and a phosphate group. So a lot of us remember from our initial biology experience that DNA had a lot of A's, T's, C's, and G's. But what exactly are those A's, T's, C's, and G's? Well, if you look here, you can see these yellow molecules. These four molecules are those A's, T's, C's, and G's 
that we use when we represent these nitrogenous bases that we're speaking of. So for example, this one here on the left, this is cytosine, and you can see there's uh, quite a lot of atoms that are involved with it. You have a lot of carbons, again we said molecules that contain carbon are organic, there's a lot of nitrogens, hydrogens, and even an oxygen that's part of the cytosine molecule. We also have thymine, another single ring structure, lots of C's, lots of H's, and N's as well. On the right, we have adenine, which is a double ring structure. Again, a lot of the same elements involved. And our last one is called guanine, our G, and it's also a double ring structure. Now, depending on if it's single ring or double ring, allows us to classify it into two families. First, the pyrimidines have a single six-membered ring. So that would be your T and your C over here on the left. The family of purines are our double ring structures, and that would be adenine and guanine. We mentioned that sugar was part of a nucleotide. So in DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. In RNA, the sugar is ribose. Now, if you look at the two, remember that DNA is ultimately the genetic material inside of the nucleus, and we make copies on RNA. So it's a very closely related molecule. DNA happens to have two strands, RNA is single-stranded. And their sugars are very similar. And if you just look at the name, we can see the part of the name is the same, the ribose part, but in DNA we have this deoxy part. If you take a look at the two structures here, can you notice any difference from one to the other? Scan. Take a moment, scan around with your eyes and see if you can come up with anything. Now, if you came up with the fact that ribose had an extra O in this position right here, you got it right. You spotted the difference. The O being missing in here leads to this prefix called deoxy. It means it's missing one of its oxygens. We talked about how monomers connect together to form polymers. So how would you eventually make a polynucleotide from a set of individual nucleotides? Well, there's a little bit of chemistry that goes along with this. Uh, perhaps you remember the term covalent bond, and that's where atoms would join together by sharing electrons. And that's going to happen in this molecule between what we call the hydroxyl group, or the OH on a three prime carbon of one nucleotide and the phosphate on the five prime carbon of the next nucleotide. Let's take a little more in-depth look at how this is built. So remember that a nucleotide is made of three parts, a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and a phosphate. Now, if you look at our sugar, our sugar here, deoxyribose, there is a carbon called our three prime carbon. And it's at the bottom left hand corner of the deoxyribose molecule. You'll notice that there's this little three with this little kind of tick mark by it here. That's what we call prime in organic chemistry. And it is gonna be connected to the phosphate here, this green blob at a five prime carbon of the next sugar molecule. So what we see here is this connection right here, again, and again, and again. Here's the little OH I'm talking about that sticks off. This is called a hydroxyl group. And through covalent bonding, it's able to bond with this phosphate on the next one, building us a chain. So as more nucleotides go into the fold here, they'll start connecting all through the same mechanism, which ultimately is called a phosphodiester bond. Now, this bond that repeats over and over and over as new monomers join on to this polymer is what we're going to term the sugar phosphate backbone. Now, if you look back to our diagram here, you'll notice that, again, the green dot is a phosphate. And you'll notice it's connected to a sugar, the blue pentagon, back to a phosphate, back to a sugar, back to a phosphate. So over and over and over again, we're going to have that same sugar phosphate chain that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's one side of a DNA molecule called the sugar phosphate backbone. Now the key to understanding DNA is the fact there's two of these sugar phosphate backbones and they're going to connect in a very special way. So if we look at the DNA molecule as a whole, there's going to be two polynucleotides spiraling around an imaginary axis running down the middle. This forms what we call a double helix. And perhaps in your earlier biology class, you might have called it a twisted ladder. Okay, It's a good descriptive uh, term that 
ultimately equates to a double helix. In the double helix, the two backbones run in opposite five prime to three prime directions from each other, an arrangement referred to as anti-parallel. Now, each polynucleotide strand of DNA runs in its own direction, and that direction is from this five prime end. If you follow the sugar ph phosphate backbone to the right, you'll find that it always ends at a three prime. So we go from five prime to three prime. But interestingly, on the other strand, we have a five prime on the opposite end, and its forward direction goes this way from right to left to the three prime end. So you have one that's red in one direction, and the other one is red in the other direction. And we call this anti-parallel. In the center of our anti-parallel strands, that's where we have our nitrogenous bases, the A's, T's, C's, and G's. Now, there's some rules to how they bond down the center. First, thymine, or T, always bonds with adenine A. And you can see that right here at the top of our chain. You can also say that cytosine C will always bond with guanine G. And that's just due to the way that these fit together. In chemistry, this is like a puzzle where we have to find what bonds would likely bond with, uh, what elements would likely bond with the other side's elements by way of a particular special type of bond down the center. But it doesn't matter which side is which. Um, adenine can be on the left, thymine can be on the right, and here you see thymine on the left and adenine on the right. And here you see guanine on the right and cytosine on the left, and here's, here you see the opposite of it. Remember, we have a five prime end and we have a three prime end per strand. And those two strands run in opposite directions from one another, which we called anti-parallel. When you have a rule that only allows one nitrogenous base to pair with another, and the other nitrogenous base to pair with the other one, we call that the law of complementary base pairing. T's complement is A, and C's complement is G. They do not bond any other way, except in the case of mutations. Those special bonds that we referred to earlier going down the center, holding them together, these dotted lines here, these are called hydrogen bonds. And they're gonna hold those bases together like a big zipper down the middle. Singularly, one single bond from an A to a T would be very weak, but as soon as you start adding more and more of these down, they get strong. So if you think of a jacket, if you had one tooth of a zipper that was connected, you could easily pull it apart, right? But then imagine you have the whole zipper zipped up and you tried to pull the two sides apart. Very difficult. So the collective strength of hundreds and thousands of hydrogen bonds will be very strong, strong enough to hold this DNA strand together as long as it needs to be. So where did all this knowledge come from? Well, there is quite a bit of history that goes with finding DNA as the true genetic material. But a man named Maurice Wilkins and a woman named Rosalind Franklin were both at the time of discovery using a particular chemical technique called X-ray crystallography to look at complex structures up close and to study what their molecular structure would likely be. What they did was they aimed x-rays at the side of organic molecules, and what it would do is it would produce an image on a screen behind it. This picture shows how it's done. X-rays pass through, in this case, the DNA molecule, and what it does, it puts up a resulting image behind it with shadows and light spots. This famous picture is called Photo 51, and this famous picture would be utilized by two other scientists to complete their model of what DNA structure actually exists as. In 1953, Watson and Crick introduced their elegant double helical model for the structure of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, based on what they were able to infer from Franklin's X-ray photograph. In the next half century, we determine that hereditary information is encoded in DNA and reproduced by all the cells of the body. We went from simply discovering what the molecule looked like to, by 50 years later, embarking on a project that would decode the entire human genome. We also learned that DNA instructions direct the development of biochemical, anatomical, physiological, and to some extent, behavioral traits. That concludes our initial lecture on DNA for forensic science. Remember to reflect on your learning targets at the end. Be able to explain what DNA is by name and biomolecule type. Describe the functions of DNA, 
explain what genes are. Also, under the umbrella of DNA structure, be able to name the monomer and what's in one of these monomers of DNA. What is the overall shape of DNA? What holds the molecule together, both the sugar phosphate backbone and the bases down the center? And lastly, what is the law of complementary base pairing? Until next time, stay safe, have a great day.